Hello, and welcome to This Week in Tech. I'm Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research, and I'm joined today by Zias Caravala, Independent Analyst with ZK Research and member of our Cube Collective community of analysts and thought leaders. Zias, great to see you. Hey, Shelley, how you been? You know, since the last time we talked, which was about two seconds ago, I've been great. Yeah. So you, Zias you and I decided... <laughs> <laughs> Zias and I decided to launch this series, this weekly series called This Week in Tech. And so we just recorded what was our first episode. This will be our second episode. And we felt like we spent the majority of the time in, in the prior conversation talking about announcements coming out of Cisco, Cisco's WebEx Live event in Amsterdam. Um, and so we decided we would hop on again and record another uh, short video conversation about sort of other things that are happening in the tech ecosystem that we think are interesting and worth talking about. So with that... We're going to dive into the conversation that's on many people's minds, the Veritas cohesity merger and the implications for data security and AI platforms. I know um, I know you have many thoughts on this, and I think that you know some folks see this as you know less of a merger and more of a strategic alignment, you know, bringing kind of the individual strengths of these two companies together to provide more comprehensive solutions, which is not unusual in today's tech world, right? Um, we've got two key players in the data protection industry, highly fragmented industry. Um, each of those players bring different skills and different kind of benefits, I think, to this. Zias, I know you wrote about this um, for Silicon Angle and and called this, uh, this a, a market that is ripe for consolidation and and in your article, you highlighted some some marketing advantages of this of this merger, and and those included reduced customer acquisition costs. You know, and, and it used to be that Cohesity was fighting against largely Veritas and Dell for customers, and so Veritas brings a pretty robust customer ecosystem into the equation. Mm -hmm. So, of course, then we'll see reduced customer acquisition costs. Um, you mentioned global expansion. Cohesity's customer base is largely centered in the United States. Veritas has customers across the world. So, you know, Cohesity's, I think, big brand and market presence combined with Veritas's larger footprint will help with customer acquisition. Um, you know, you also mentioned the, the fact that you thought that Cohesity's big customer base meant that it has a large data set for AI and, and then bringing the Veritas customer base into that equation will help no doubt supercharge the company's AI efforts. And, and lastly, you touched a little bit on the financial benefits and that's always a big part of any, of any situation like this. And Veritas brings profitability into the equation, which I think allows the companies then to spend more on R&D and expansion and innovation and, and be able to kind of do all of that in a, in a speedier manner. So um, touched on a lot of the a lot of the pros that you outlined in your article yesterday. Let's weigh in a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, it was an interesting move. Um, uh, you know, when I when I look at the uh, the landscape and I'm looking at a spreadsheet of all the vendors in the data protection space, I think there's fifty of them. So that's a lot. That's a right? lot. And there's really only a handful that matter, right? That that are of significant size and cohesity. Um, and Veritas were two of them, although at 3% share, uh, Cohesity was a relatively small player, right? right. Um, although nobody's a big player. I think the market leaders uh, veen with 12%. So that tells you how fragmented it is. And so it is ripe for consolidation. Um, in, now, one of the things I pointed out in my post is in general, I'm not a big fan when a disruptor um, acquires a legacy provider. And, um, and I did caveat that with in general, because it, it often denotes uh, that the innovators growth had slowed down. Uh, Michael Thacker from Cohesity reached out to me and said, how dare you? You're wrong about this. We haven't slowed down. Here's an IDC link to an IDC report that says we're growing. And indeed, at 3%, they are showing a higher growth rate than see a Veeam, who's about 10 percenter, you know, um, uh, which, but again, he was four times as big. So take that with what you will. But on the point though, they, they still are they are growing in um, in the teens, which is good. So, uh, and, and the other reason I found it curious, though, is they both go after the same customer segment, which is large enterprise. And so there will be some product rationalization to do. 
Um, mm -hmm. I also found it interesting that from Veritas, it wasn't the, all of Veritas, right? They took pieces of it. They didn't right. take the, the SMB product. They took the large enterprise product. At least if they take the SMB product, you could argue it would open up a different segment for them, right? right. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I also think the cultures are different. Everybody says the cultures are aligned, but you never know until you get into it. But Veritas has been on a slow decline for the better part of two decades, right? They were by the de facto standard for a long time, and they have sh they have been the, the biggest share donor for the last, oh, I don't know, 15 years. <laughs> and, um, and so they've largely been focused on keeping the customers they have where Cohesity's the culture has been really more about customer acquisition. And right. so often those two things don't really gel. So I do think there's a lot of potential for the deal, but I also think there's a lot of risk for the deal. And um, for the price they paid, um, they could have acquired a lot of customers, you know, yeah. for that amount and maybe given them a customer base. The, the one thing, Shelley, that I think companies don't often understand when they make acquisitions like this is just because you're the incumbent vendor, nobody's going to hand you the business. And uh, true. I remember, yeah, I remember when, when Mitel and Shortel merged, Mitel bought Shortel for its cloud platform and they thought all the, sh the Mitel customers would automatically jump on the Shortel cloud. But what they found out was that, you know, customers were still going through their regular RFP process and the incumbency didn't make diff make a difference at all. If you're going to change vendors, you're going to change vendors and you're going to weigh your incumbent in as with equal footing as any other one. And so um, I, I think that the thesis may be that you become the de facto upgrade, but that doesn't always happen. And so there's yeah. there's the risk, right? So you took on $2 billion in debt in order to do this. So your execution better be fast. And I think in the yeah. short term, the Convolts and Beans and Dells they're going to jump all over the customer base with all this FUD telling them why this isn't a good deal. And so <laughs> Sanjay Poonin, I will say the CEO, is a, he's, a, he's an execution machine. But this is he something is. he's got to execute sooner than later, though, because there's a, the, the more uncertainty there is, the more competitive FUD will be out there, which puts more doubt in the customer's minds. Well, and, you know, I mean, there are some product redundancy issues and yeah. integration when you have a situation like this, integration is always a challenge. And a lot of times customers don't want to wade through that muck, you know, and I think that if I or the competitors in this space, that's what I'm going to be coming to my customers and my prospects talking about, you know, yeah. do you really want to slog through this? And and, you know, what's that going to look like and what kind of a pain in the neck is it going to be? So I, I do think that is a definite challenge for them. Yeah, well, we'll see what, you know, the, obviously that's, a, again, when you, when you, anytime you enter a consolidation play, um, it, 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 execution does depend on a, a lot of things, including staff reduction, product rationalization, um, you know, the margin profiles of both companies are quite different. And so there's a lot of moving parts and, right. um, you know, I, I do think, you know, Sanjay Poonin has proven he can execute. So let's, you know, this is time for him to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and in your article, you also mentioned the challenge of debt management as being an yeah. issue. You want to touch on that well, a little bit? I mean, well, especially pretty... today um, yeah. with uh, with interest rates being so high, right? If it was a few years ago where you had sub 2% interest rates, Wouldn't sure, be bad. Out of, it's free money. Um, but, but to you know, so there, there are, there'll be about, I think the... The news story said they'd be about 1.6 billion in revenue combined, and they got two billion in debt, right? So that means a good chunk of their earnings every year will go to pay off the interest, and then they go to service the debt. And so right. if they can actually make this company some, you know, a one plus one equals five, an IPO, and raise lots of money, they can pay that on the debt. If yep. if they if the integration takes longer than expected, and they shed some customers, the revenue base drops from that 1.6. Now your revenue uh to um to debt ratio goes up right right uh, you know the changes and then um and then then you wind up with a problem on your hands right. um you know we've seen many companies go through that right avaya riverbed companies like that yeah. and so you know for and this is why crisp integration has to happen sooner than later to make sure that that one plus one does equal five and they're able to capitalize on this and raise the money they need to, to be able to pay off the debt you know, it is interesting, the the chatter um, among, you know, analysts and others in the space, you know, some people have viewed this as a, you know, cohesity, cohesity has, has 
been looking for opportunities for alliances and partnerships. As you mentioned, um, Sanjay Poonin has a background in leading successful ap uh, acquisitions, so that's a positive thing. But there are other analysts who think this is, you know, who are less than enthusiastic about this. One comment I saw was, you know, this is this reminds me of the disastrous Symantec Veritas merger. And so it's interesting to see the different voices on, uh, you know, in the analyst community on this. And you know, one thing I know for sure. Well, there's a lot less product overlap there, right? So, yep. I mean, I think that's a valid statement. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll be watching. That's for yeah. sure. So with that, now I know you last week were at um, F5 App Worlds event took place in San Jose, and um, hopefully all that rain business was done. Uh, well, the event was inside, so that was good. It rained a little. Well, bit, obviously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, I have a lot of friends in the area who have really yeah. been sort of inundated with all the crazy. Yeah, we had we found out we had like uh, you know leaks in our sunroom and things like that, but uh, yeah. uh, we got a lot of rain. That's for sure. Yeah. So, you know, as expected at this or pretty much any event, AI was pretty much in every conversation and every presentation. I know that F5 announced the F5 AI data fabric, which is a new data platform designed to deliver, um, you know, putting AI to work to provide better app and API protection and and more quickly and more easy to use. I think that's something, you know, quick and easy to use. So those are the key um parts of any value prop today. Um, this data fabric is designed to help adapt and respond to threats in a quick way. Um, generative AI is supposed to improve the user experience. Um, I know that F5 said they'll be introducing an, an, F, an AI assistant later in 2024 that'll give customers an intelligent partner. I don't know who's not doing this, right? <laughs> you know, everybody everywhere. Um, but this, this uh, F5's NLP interface will allow users to ask questions of their data and generate dashboards in real time. And I can see this as being incredibly valuable, just like we're learning you know, to um, voice, use voice commands in terms of creating images and things like that, that functionality that we're starting to get accustomed to. I think being able to, you know, look at your data, ask questions, have dashboards generated in real time, that would be huge. Um, and then, you know, part of what F5 is saying that this will assist with is with help implementing a policy or generating product configurations and things like that. And the tools expected to act as an embedded customer support manager, which lets customers act, ask their questions and get recommendations based on the collective knowledge available to F5. And this is where I think it is something worth thinking about, you know, your um, your knowledge base is only as valuable as the amount of data that's fed into it, right? And so, you know, when you have a question engine and you're asking for solutions or recommendations or whatever, you know, your knowledge base needs to be constantly being fed and it needs to be pretty robust. So that'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, I was there actually speaking at the investor event and yep. um, F5 is a fascinating company. And I'll talk about the structure of the company first, then why the AI stuff matters. So if, and it's um, the application delivery controller space isn't one that's um, for a lot of people's obvious as to what it does, right? So a server is easy, right? It's a server network boxes, um, uh, provide network traffic. When you, when you deploy a workload, there are a bunch of things that you need around the workload to make it work better. You need to load balance, right. you need DNS, you need to encrypt SSL traffic or decrypt it, right? You need uh, different types of security services. And so F5 has always been that product that sits between the applications and the network. I characterize it as the Rosetta Stone. It talks networking, it talks applications, and it translates, it translates those things to make sure the apps run optimally. Now, as app architecture has changed, so have the form factor for application delivery controllers. So you needed a virtual one. So when you think about what happened with virtualization, I could put a workload in motion. If I'm using only physical ADCs, how do I then take those ADC services and move it with the workload? I got to do a virtualized version. So as apps move to the cloud, I have to create a cloud you know, uh, uh, version of ADCs. As things have moved more to containers, I need containerized services, right? As the app, the API economy is driven, right? Now I need API level services. And so historically, uh, when you look at the companies that have played in the space, there have been different companies that have serviced each one. 
F5's done a roll-up of a bunch of different products, Nginx, Volterra. They just bought a company called Web that does API level ones. And they're the only company that's created a platform, an ADC platform where all your application and security services that you need are available from them. Now, the reason AI becomes important is, let's say I want to create a security policy that doesn't allow certain users to access certain applications, or I want to, uh, if uh, uh, some user authentication fails, I want to deny access to these types of services. Well, if I've got five different types of ADCs in five different places, I'd have to make sure those policies are in alignment, right? So now I can right. create once, propagate it out across the environment, right? So uh, that's kind of I think huh? that's beautiful music, right? Yeah. And like, to me, they're a, they're a fascinating company and one that's largely misunderstood um, because they play a really important role. Um, I know there's some criticism from some financial analysts that think, well, you can just buy your load balancers and things from the cloud. You can, but an AWS load balancer isn't going to work in GCP. And a right. GCP one's not going to work in Azure, right? So right. they're the only ones that create that cross cloud fabric. And if you believe... So my message to the financial analysts was, if you believe the world's going hybrid multi-cloud, nobody's going to argue with that. If you believe that increases complexity, right, then F5 is the only one that can create that fabric that sits between that cloud layer or the that hybrid multi-cloud layer and the apps can create, can create those services. So um, uh, so I think that uh, they're, they're really in kind of a unique position in yeah. that. Uh, I, I like them, their positioning here. Uh, I, I think that, and I think what AI does is it just allows them to to continue to reduce complexity. So the more complicated the world becomes from an app perspective, the more you need a company like F5 to simplify. I agree. I agree. And, you know, I'm going back to, you know, the, the interactive dashboards and things like that. I mean, being able to query things like how many attacks did my infrastructure experience last week? How many of those were SQL injection attacks? Where are they coming from? That kind of functionality, I think, is really attractive. And I do think that you make a really, really good point um, in terms of, you know, things are getting so complex. And the more that vendors can do to simplify user experiences in every way, I think they simplify functionality, simplify, adop you know, speeds adoption, all of these things, I think this is really, really important. Great. So uh, I know that, you know, we covered a couple of things here, and I think we're going to talk a little bit now as we wrap up this show about just what we're seeing in terms of performance, vendor performance in the security sector. And, you know, in short, security is as strong as ever, makes perfect sense. You know, there, the rise in cyber threats is astronomical, that is not expected to to stop any time soon, you know, as all of us race to embrace AI and integrate AI into our business operations, threat actors are using AI to help speed and launch uh, attacks and that sort of thing. So, so it's really interesting. Let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing a little bit on the earnings front. I know you mentioned Fortinet earlier and the fact that they might have kind of crushed it. Yeah, Fortinet put up a, uh, a very strong Q4. Uh, it was, yeah. you know, a, a beat and raise for them. Uh, the stock jumped 16% after in after hours trading. That's uh, a lot. Strong guidance as well. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, th there's obviously, I think Fortinet's a very, um, um, uh, their execution there's always been very strong, right? They, yeah. they, they don't do things that don't directly lead to revenue. Uh, they, they could market better. <laughs> Uh, but for the most part, Fortinet's, uh, you know, the, their execution has always been very strong. But I do think the secular trends that are following this concept of the security platform, it, it's creating some tailwinds for them and Palo yeah. and Zscaler, the bigger security vendors. Um, and I think, you know, a, a, C, a CISO said this to me earlier, uh, or last year, I guess, since we're in 2024 now, where he, he finally understood that you, best to breed everywhere doesn't lead to best in class threat protection. And what he was talking about was if I try and go best to read everywhere, now from a policy perspective and a configuration perspective, there's so much heavy lifting involved that I, I just can't keep up. Right. And I, and, um, I think, um, so we are seeing more of a drive towards platform. And now this is where the interesting dynamic comes from is the Fortinet platform better than Palo Alto's and which is, or is better than Cisco's or, 
Uh, you know, how do you measure the performance of a security platform? So I don't think companies are ever going to go down to one platform, but I do think you'll, the days of 200 security vendors is rapidly coming to an end. And companies will actually look for... Um, hey, Zeus, can you pick up... Can you pick up... I don't know if it's internet on your end or my end, what's going on, but it's, it has to do with your transition transmission. And so if you could just pick up uh, this, kind of maybe start over with this sentence. I, I, I can't tell exactly where we glitched, but you actually completely went away for a oh. second. Well, StreamYard does record locally, right? Yes. And then and then upload. So even if you couldn't see me, but I can start over. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear any audio or anything. So uh, okay. you know, we can just just kind of dive in again, just in case. Okay. All right. Well, Ford did announce earnings uh, this week, and they put up a very strong beat and raise quarter. They raised um, uh, their numbers for uh, for next quarter as well. It was a Q four, so they finished off the year strong. Uh, now this isn't a surprise to me because I do think. The tailwinds created by the ship to security platform is helping them, but also the other bigger security vendors. And so we're seeing a bit of a rising tide here. Um, and I, I think what we're seeing here is finally the realization from security professionals. In fact, the CISO said this to me last year that he finally understands that best to breed everywhere doesn't lead to best in class threat protection. And we discussed that a little bit further. And, and he talked about how with when you try and do best to breed everywhere, um, you wind up with the, from a management and policy perspective, having to do all that on a box by box basis or a vendor by vendor basis. And that right. the, the manual overhead on that is it's, it's just astronomically high. And so, especially now with AI becoming a big part of security, you want to have more data from, you know, fewer vendors. And so I don't think companies are ever going out of one security platform, but they're likely to pick two or three that they decide to go forward with. And, uh, you know, foreign net certainly has become one of them. But I think an interesting challenge for the vendor community and buyers is how you differentiate these security platforms. Is the foreign net platform really better than Palos or is Palos better than Cisco? So is Cisco or is Cisco? Where is Zscaler? Where does Zscaler? You know, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to tell the performance of these things, um, I guess, until you're breached. <laughs> you know, and at that point, maybe it's, maybe it's too late. But uh, uh, I do think this is a, a trend we'll continue to see is more and more companies converging and consolidating down their security vendors, especially in the AI era where you do need a unified data set. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Well, with that, unless there's something else you'd like to touch on, I think. No, I think, uh, you know, we're going to, I think security is going to be fun to watch. We should see lots and lots of innovation here. RSA is coming up. I'm expecting while I, while we are consolidating down to security vendors, there's always new startups coming. And so there's never a sleepy day in the world of cyber. <laughs> never a dull moment. And you know, it's, when you say something like there's never a sleepy day, what I think about all the time is truly how CISOs get a minute sleep. Because I, I just feel like it's so such a stressful job, so much responsibility, so much constantly changing. I mean, um, it is, you're right. They do not get, they can't. Get I do not know who would want to be a CISO for a bank or a government institution or, you know, a retailer where people. You get Utility, thousands, critical infrastructure. Thousands. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? Paying them a whole lot of money is great, but they're still, you're still carrying around that huge responsibility and so yeah. much stress. And, and it's, you know, as you said, it's a rapidly evolving landscape and, you know, threat actors are just going to keep getting better, you know? And, and so anyway, that's well, why you need AI. You're going to fight fire with fire. If the threat actor is using AI, you have no choice, but to use AI back. 100%. So with that, we're going to uh, wrap this second episode of this week in tech. Zia Caravala, thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to being back here with you again next week and to our viewing and listening audience. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.